Hey, how's it going? Do you find yourself a person with no political power, arguing with other people with no political power about the best way to use political power? Have you ever thought it might not be worth the time? Have you ever wondered why you argue about something you can't change? I have a couple of answers. I'm Chris, and welcome to today's main feature at your handheld theater. This video is part two of a series on nations and nationalism, trying to answer the question, what is a country? To start, let's get political. What does it mean to say something is political? If I pick my nose in this room, is it political? No, because the police won't try to stop me. Politics is where people attempt to accumulate the power to use the state. Politics as we know it is organized on national lines. National or federal political institutions have the biggest budgets, the biggest ministries, the most enforcement, and pretty much set the rules for what you're allowed to do everywhere in the world. On paper, government powers are limited. In practice, they're always expanding. The state's purpose is concentrating and using power. Possibly by definition, but certainly in practice, power doesn't recognize limits. And I think a lot of us realize all that intuitively, so the only ways of limiting state power that we can come up with that we think would be realistic and therefore worth proposing are theoretical limits, like rights for citizens. Rights are theoretical limits on state power that exists if the state chooses to enforce them, and nothing exists to force it to, so it might, depending which right, which situation, and who you are. If it guaranteed your rights, the state would have to uphold everyone's rights every time, and then how would it wield unchecked power over them? As I explained in part one, states take their shape because of the territory they've conquered and the people they've subjugated. After conquering territory, st states extend their power over their subjects' lives. At this point in history, state violence regulates virtually every aspect of life. It considers everything under its power, subject to its laws, and any freedom you have is only because it hasn't been legislated away. Everything seems political because everything that matters is subjected to the power of the state. I feel bad for people who think their country is particularly bad because, apparently unlike everywhere else, the government there doesn't work for the people. They don't realize it's nothing to do with their unique culture and everything to do with power. The problem could always be worse where they're from than other places, but it's still because of a capitalist, imperialist, patriarchal power structure. Power and hierarchy are why people in every country have the same complaints about their country. Wherever you're from, let me guess, okay? Rich and well-connected people from, uh, from everywhere get what they want, and everyone else gets screwed. Even, you can be sure, even rich people from other places are treated much better than you in your hometown. You know why, right? It's because the system the world lives under only respects money. The laws you have to follow, the likelihood you'll be arrested, charged, and sentenced, your guilt or innocence, the severity of your punishment, all depend on your proximity to power. In every country, we're taught from childhood the correct way to govern is to concentrate decision-making power in the hands of a tiny minority of the population. Power might express itself differently depending on the culture, but if there's a ruling class, the people are taught to believe in hierarchy for one reason or another. In the places I know, learning hierarchy starts with our parents, who punish us to make us grow up right, proceeding to teachers who punish us in the name of education, and then police who punish us in the name of law and order. The people at the top are there because they're wise, or they deserve it somehow, so they make all the decisions alone, including when and how to punish us. 
So on the one hand, we learn to accept being ruled by other people right from the start. But on the other, at least in most countries, we learn we're free, self-governing people living in a democracy that exists to serve us and uphold our rights. A democracy means the people are in charge. On paper. This belief is central to modern propaganda, which is why I've spent so much time debunking it. But in brief, we've been taught that as some of us voted for a few of the people who hold prominent roles in the state, everything the state does to us is legitimate. It's us doing it to ourselves. If you don't like it, you must not have democracy right. Since the government represents the people, the logic seems to go, they have to work for us, in spite of all evidence to the contrary. Accepting propaganda beliefs as an adult is easy because they're comfortable beliefs. If the authorities have the situation under control, I don't have to think about it, and I can go back to work. Among other powers they grant themselves, states own the land and other resources of the territory they claim. They can control the resources directly, or more commonly nowadays, lease them out to corporations and landlords. The more territory states have, the more power they have, which is why many of them have expanded to cover millions of square kilometers, and why we have these things called countries. People fight so furiously for control of the state because the stakes are so high. But if you're not fighting for control, you probably have no influence on the state. Most countries or nation states contain millions of people. That's potentially millions of different points of view. Having been told your voice matters in this liberal democracy, you want to express yourself and assume your voice will be heard. If you lived somewhere where everyone's points of view could coexist, a world where many worlds fit, as the Zapatistas say, that'd be great. If nobody had the power to force us all into the same social system, we wouldn't need to argue over the one correct way to organize it. But that's not the world of 2023. You live under the thumb of the nation-state. When you disagree with someone on policy, you're disagreeing about how to use force on everyone living in your so-called country. When you talk about who you should vote for, you're considering which party should have more power than the others to own and extract resources, make policies, and spread propaganda. That might lead to some pretty heated arguments. But why do we argue about politics if we have little to no influence on it? What power do we have to carry out anything we think should be done? For example, we argue with our friends or anonymous people online over budgets. And what's the correct use of government revenue? Because it was taken from us and that makes us think we deserve a say in how that money gets allocated. We're the hard-working, tax-paying... Decent, honest, hard-working, law-abiding, tax-paying, normal, sensible, reasonable, down-to-earth, hard-working, normal, law-abiding, down-to-earth, sensible, reasonable people. <laughs> people will argue for hours over the, the, the right and wrong way to spend money that's already been taken from them and over which they no longer have any say. We value what gets called democracy because we get told our voice matters. So we have to speak out in case, like they told us at school, what we think gets translated into policy. But that's not how policy is made. Policy is made for people who pay for it. Unfortunately, we might still have to argue because while our individual opinions might not matter much, power keeps forcing people to defend themselves against it. Look out how, in the past few years, the right wing has decided to make transgender people an issue. They weren't before. They were just people living their lives. But some people realized they could gain power by making being trans an issue. They're now passing policies to forcibly detransition people. Making something an issue doesn't start with policy. It starts with a lie. People nowadays are somewhat accepting and understanding, so of course they won't necessarily have a problem with trans people. So if someone wants power, they'll need to make a lot of stuff up. 
But fortunately for them, they're part of a whole coalition of people who also want power, who immediately accept and repeat their lies. Over the past few years, right-wingers have come up with every excuse they could scrape up to demonize trans people. They've especially tried to connect trans people to pedophilia, because if you're going to have an enemy and you want them killed, the quickest way to do it is to label them a threat to children. They did it to gay people, and they still do. And now they've added trans people. They're not going to stop trying to get trans people to detransition and conform to their narrow standards, or killed, until their attention is diverted again, which means we have to argue about trans people. The right wing has turned them into a question that requires a kind of solution. Instead of just letting people live their lives, we have to argue to counter the lies and kill the policies. Why does the state even have the power to detransition someone? Why do we just accept the state can punish you for dressing the wrong way, or growing your hair too long, or changing your name? Why does everything seem political? Because power-hungry people make everything political, however many lives it ruins. So what's to be done about the idea that everything is political? The easiest solution for most people would be to not engage. Most political bickering is a complete waste of time. Are you learning anything? Are you persuading anyone? Are you just getting bitter? We might be able to do much better by refusing to engage in an argument that will go around in circles and doing something instead. Some people are too busy doing mutual aid and confronting their oppressors to argue online. But because everything is political, you're still affected by politics and social institutions even when you try to ignore them. The ideal is to end the nation-state's monopoly on making and enforcing the law. That requires ripping one's freedom away from it, asserting with force our existence as free people. But that's not about to happen anytime soon, as regardless of how little legitimacy it has, a state will continue to try to impose its will on you. Much more likely in the short term is more fascist parties gaining power through elections. Then it'll be too late to talk, and rebellion or complicity will be the only options. That's why we need to organize and build horizontal power to counter hierarchical systems. Think of it as anti-politics, breaking the state's monopoly on governance and putting our lives back in our own hands, so that when we talk about how to govern, it'll be how to govern ourselves. Thanks.